it's my pleasure to introduce the next uh, speaker of the day, Peter Klaes from the KU Leuven. Uh, after career steps in Leuven, Melbourne and Oxford, uh, Peter is now associate professor at KU, KU Leuven uh, and he holds a dual appointment at the Department of Electrical Engineering, Processing of Speech and Images and the Department of Human Genetics. And that's a, a particular flavor and a particular expertise in, in his uh, research that he, he knows about this boundary between imaging and genetics. He's an honorary fellow at the Murdoch Children's Research Institute in Melbourne. Um, and he organized two international workshops on facial genetics. So exactly this boundary I, de I described. He's also a member of the Leuven Institute for Human Genomics and Society. So we are very happy to have him here uh, to learn more about medical imaging and analysis in the era of, of uh, big data, which is a, a fundamental uh, column and, and part of our uh, network's topic on, on machine learning for personalized medicine. So thank you for joining us today and we are looking forward to your talk. Okay, thank you, Carson, for the kind introduction. And thank you also for inviting me here today. As you mentioned, the topic of my talk will be about medical imaging and analysis in the era of big data. Just a brief uh, outline to begin with, I will talk about why I consider imaging to be big data. I will talk about different imaging modalities, the analysis, and if time permits, I will also dive into some particular applications that I myself have been focused on in the past 15 years or so. So imaging and deep, uh, big data, it, it's all related to the idea of deep phenotyping, which is quite uh, popular today. And I, when you look at deep phenotyping, you actually are looking at three distinct aspects. First of all, deep phenotyping involves intensive, so a lot of measurements of the same thing. Extensive, many different things are being measured of a person and large scale. You're trying to measure these on a very large population of individuals. So deep phenotyping, definitely uh, arises from intensive, extensive, and large-scale data collections. If I'm looking at images, images by themselves are big, and they basically underpin the intensive phenotyping of deep phenotyping. So an image is collecting tons of data in a single shot. And in fact, images have been increased in data size over many, many years. Uh, as you are all familiar with the cell phone, in the early days, you had a one or two megabyte pixel uh, camera. The cell phones of today's, they have 15 uh, megabyte pixels and, and many more. So the resolution of these images is increasing. So the amount of data that an image uh, is collecting is more and more. So the images are definitely big. They've always been big and they're just getting bigger. That's basically uh, the feedback here. At the same time, I also want to introduce another kind of concept that is related to imaging, which is basically feature extraction and pattern recognition. Often images are used to do some recognition. And this is done by feature extraction. Here simply as an example, if you want to for, uh, classify apples from pears, what you try to do is you, you try to extract some features based on shape and color, for example. And those two features are allowing you to basically uh, recognize apples from pears, apples being red and round and pears being green and a bit of an oval uh, shape. So if you combine feature extraction and pattern recognition with big data, well, basically those are the two key ingredients for the era of deep learning as we are witnessing today. Now, deep learning itself is not new. It is a subfield of a larger field known as artificial intelligence and artificial intelligence has been popular since the eighties and the nineties. However, the way intelligence is being approached has changed over the years going from the implementation of knowledge expert systems to shallow learning as we say from imaging descriptors to deep learning from raw images nevertheless image data has been part of ai from the beginning like image analysis have been using ai since the 50s 60s and 70s to do the first imaging processing and analysis pipelines and of course a lot of deep learning today has become successful particularly by working on image data the only distinction of AI in the past and deep learning today is the access to large scale data. Large scale data is a key ingredient for deep learning and machine learning today to be applicable uh, on data. If we simply look at these deep learning networks, I think we're all familiar based on this summer school that these consist of artificial neural networks and in, in itself is just a connection of very simple units that on themselves are, are a, bit, a bit naive, but when combined, uh, in, in multitude, they really can uh, come solve a complex task. And often the comparison is being made to the human brain. 
which also consists of uh, primary elements of neurons that are being connected um, into a very intelligent system being ourselves. Okay? And artificial neural networks are trying to mimic the same kind of architecture that is observed in the human brain. The key difference of uh, deep learning today and machine learning, let's say uh, 20 years ago, is the following. If I look at an image in the past, we spend a lot of time thinking about what kind of features would I be extracting from the image, knowing that these features could potentially solve uh, a problem. So you would do uh, something known as manual or, or engineered feature extraction. In the past, as an, if you were uh, and doing a PhD in engineering, basically, if you found a new feature, you finished your PhD. That, that was the way to get your PhD in the past. Today, with deep learning, we have an end-to-end -end situation. So basically, this engineered feature extraction step is skipped, and the deep learning network is going to learn automatically to what extent the uh, features um, it needs to learn to optimally solve a, a particular task. So now if you want to obtain a PhD in engineering, it's a completely different ball game. And it's all about getting enough data, sensitive data, and to control your data for these deep learning networks to be applicable. And they're very successful. And we have seen this, especially on image data and has progressed into many other different fields. But I think deep learning has really gained a boost by solving very complex imaging tasks. And the first, the worst, most well-known imaging task is the one of ImageNet where millions of images are being collected and categorized in, in, in groups. And basically, deep learning has cracked the ability to, given the image, classify the object that is seen in the image, as you can see here, the identification of flowers, elephants, boats, and so on. And this is where really the feature learning of deep learning has excelled uh, in solving these tasks. So in other words, if you look at large-scale imaging data sets, these are the new gold in data science and imaging analysis today. And I'm just listing here a few. There are, there are initiatives of collecting uh, a lot of uh, data on individuals, including imaging data. And I think the, the best known here might be the UK Biobank, which has also been collecting uh, MRI imaging on participants. But essentially, these kind of collections are providing the next generation of uh, machine learning to be applied. If I look at imaging modalities, so the second part of the, the talk, there are quite a few. And if you're interested in more details, I'm, I'm just gonna go briefly over them because I, I won't have the time to dive into much detail. But for those who are interested, I do recommend the following book on the fundamentals of medical imaging by Professor Paul Sutens, who also was my supervisor for my PhD. But just to go over a few of these modalities, I think something that is familiar to all of us is simply uh, 2D, two-dimensional photography. Two-dimensional photography is still very used in clinical routines, especially in craniofacial surgery, for example, where images are being taken of the patient before and after uh, treatment. If you move from two-dimensional photography today, we can also do three-dimensional photography. And this is done by a three-dimensional scanner. And essentially, it is like multiple cameras that are looking at an object from uh, different points of view. And together, they can triangulate uh, the image back into 3D. It's much like how our two eyes are working. We have two eyes, so two different cameras, slightly deviating apart in distance. So together, we can basically perceive depth uh, in the surroundings. And these cameras work in the same uh, way. But a 3D image is essentially a point cloud of the collection, which is being connected into a wireframe. And then using computer graphics, you can render this into a surface. So you can put some light and you can really observe a continuous surface. And typically, you can just simply add some texture to make it um, more realistic and more interesting to look at. If we move from 3D, oh, that was one uh, button too fast. My apologies. So today, we've also moved into the era of four-dimensional imaging. And it's the same idea. Again, you have these, these spots that are looking at the object. But now the object is moving and the pots are essentially recording movies. So this is a, a, a dynamic 3D or sometimes called four-dimensional photography. And this is quite interesting, again, uh, like in surgery, like uh, in facial palsy. So you have some part of the face that uh, lost its nerve function. And the surgeons uh, try to repair it. They can then reassess the movement in the face or other parts, uh, like in orthopedics, if your knee is bended properly and stuff like that. So this is kind of an interesting new imaging modality that is finding its way into the clinical practice uh, more slowly. If you look at, well, the more medical uh, modalities, the first one that is best known is X-ray imaging. 
X-rays are essentially electromagnetic waves that emit a photon-based radiation, and that were discovered by Willem Konrad Röntgen in 1895. Basically, what happens here is like X-ray vision, and like you see also in, uh, in airports, like X-rays are are scattered and they move through the object and they're either absorbed or scattered by the internal structures. So that an X-ray collector behind the ob uh, object records the intensity of the X-ray. So if you have a substance that absorbs all the X-ray, you will have a, dark, uh, a darker region. If you have something that scatters the X-ray through, you will have a light. So you have intensity changes like grayscale value. And here, for example, you have an X-ray of the chest so you can look at the, uh, at the ribs and the lungs of the person. So you really see through the body, essentially. A nice innovation into uh, X-ray imaging is uh, X-ray computer tomography. And it's also using X-rays, as it says in the title. But the clever thing is the manner in which the X-rays are being uh, imaged. So there is a whole setup now involved with a patient lying on a table and being uh, pulled into a rotating device. And it's basically uh, accumulating X-ray imaging. And together, thanks to computer algorithms, they are able to reconstruct uh, a three-dimensional image, slice by slice. So you see here a movie where we actually going slice by slice through the patient's uh, body. But instead of having a planar two-dimensional projection of a three-dimensional structure, thanks to the rotating movement around the, the patient, you are actually able to reconstruct the full body in three dimensions. And here, depending again on the tissue, like heart tissue, is uh, uh, absorbent and, and soft to less. So you, the intensity changes are going to display different types of soft tissue and hard tissue uh, in the, of the internal body. And a similar kind of adaptation in this, this technology, but more broadly applicable to orthodontics is known as comb beam CT. Again, it's an X-ray imaging device, but instead of having a rotating slice by slice, we're now beaming a, a full cone uh, of X-rays at the same time. And the result is essentially this, that you need uh, less acquisition time and le hence less radiation to make a full three-dimensional image. And this is one of the reasons why this is so popular in orthodontics, because there, like the, the risk of exposure to, to treatment gain is not so high. So you don't want to have a system that gives a lot of X-ray radiation to the uh, patient to be imaged. But essentially, these are all X-ray uh, based imaging. But you can do more. You can also say, you can also add some contrast agents to the, to the patient's bloodstream, for example. Uh, and typically these are then um, radio opaque material. So it, they get, they, they really absorb the X-rays and hence they really, um, the contrast of these structures is being enhanced in the image. So here there is a contrast agent being uh, admitted to the blood flow, to the bloodstream of the person. And as such, you can really highlight the blood veins in the hand on the left or in the neck and head and brain on the right. This is what is called as CT angiography. So it's by administering an additional uh, contrast agent into the bloodstream. Other types of CT scanning are dynamic, like imaging the heart is not an easy, an easy thing to do, where there the, the scanner is essentially aligned with the rhythm of the heart and you, you can kind of take uh, pictures at a certain stage of the heart uh, cyclus. As well as if you're using the perfusion, you can continuously image the patient and actually follow the flow of the contrast agent through uh, the veins and the blood vessels. And as such, you can investigate if certain parts in the brain in this case are being uh, under, uh, well, if they have enough blood, yes or no. And of, uh, in, in cases of a stroke, there will be uh, well regions in the brain where this imaging is then revealing that there is no blood flow to the, that part in the brain. And this is then to localize the obstruction and then uh, operate or trying to treat uh, it as such. So this is known as dynamic CT. So basically it's like a movie of CT scans. That's another way of looking at it. Um, and it gives you some dynamic information. Another type of imaging modality that's very popular um, and well, often using complement to CT scanning is magnetic resonance imaging. It's very different. It's also non-invasive and it's using not X-ray um, beams, but it's using a magnetic field. And basically, um, so the, the idea is for when, when um, different tissues are being, um, are being uh, exposed to a certain magnetic phase, they're out, they're at the magnetic phase of the atoms of the tissue will change under the influence of this external magnetic field. And this change can actually be visualized. 
And depending on the tissue, there's gonna be a different reaction to the magnetic field. And again, you, ha you have different intensities and hence you can discriminate different tissue types from each other. But what is more interesting as well is that in an in a MRI, you can also play with the magnetic field sequence properties and hence you can put more or less emphasis on different tissues. Here are a few different MRI sequences and I'm just gonna highlight the first one is a T1, it's known as a T1 MRI uh, sequence. And that is basically used to uh, image the brain anatomy because in this kind of image, we can really differentiate well between the gray matter, the white matter and the CSF in the brain. A flare image is another example in which the, uh, the, well, the magnetic field sequence is different, but that's an image that is typically used to emphasize uh, tumors. So um, uh, different types of cell, tissue of tumor uh, tissue will be emphasized using flare imaging and other pathologies. And that's the nice thing about MRI imaging. You can really play with the sequences and hence emphasize different tissues of interest, either the anatomy or some uh, pathological uh, aspects. Similar to CT, here as well, you can also add contrast agents, but instead of uh, having a radio opaque uh, contrast agents, this would be something that is paramagnetic. So something that is highly influenced by the magnetic field and hence lights up in the image of the MRI. Here you can see again, uh, this contrast agent is again uh, administered to the blood flow. And also with this contrast agent, you can highlight uh, the blood vessels and the bloodstream uh, as such in, in certain parts. Another really uh, cool uh, thing for MRI imaging is something known as functional MRI imaging and blood uh, bolt imaging or blood oxygen level dependent imaging fMRI is one example of this. And essentially what it does is it's following the following uh, uh, assumption. So when, when certain parts in the brain get activated, they're gonna require some oxygen consumption. So there's gonna be an increased blood flow to these uh, parts in the brain and it's gonna, as such, gonna be a, an oxygen uh, concentration. Now, what is of interest is that um, the parts that have a high level of oxygen have a different magnetic property than the parts in the brain that have a lower level of oxygen. So hence, you can emphasize the parts in the brain that are being activated during certain tasks. Here in the slides, you basically see um, the activation of the brain when a person is holding his breath. So basically uh, getting an oxygen deprived situation on the top, you see like uh, holding your breath after 14 seconds. And at the bottom, you see, uh, well, uh, the blood trying to compensate for the lack of flow, uh, oxygen after 27 seconds. So you can really see that the whole brain is being lit up by this imaging. Now you can use this uh, in the following uh, setups. For example, you can actually ask people to do something or to look at something. And then you can moder moder uh, monitor the activation of oxygen and hence the blood flow in the brain as such. On the left, you see an example of the activation of brain regions that are involved in speech and language on the top. But interestingly, it has shown that the same regions in the brain are also activated by gesture language. So not spoken language, but uh, gesture language and spoken language turn out to be processed by the same uh, regions in the brain. And this is uh, visualized thanks to the bold functional MRI imaging. On the right, you can see activations of the brain for the motoric and sensory skills. And so the person is trying to um, to perform a motoric uh, exercise. And by at the same time um, imaging the brain, you can actually see which regions in the brain are responsible for your motoric and sensory skills as such. So this is what is known as functional MRI. The next uh, modality down, which is also very interesting is known as nuclear medicine imaging. Uh, and it sometimes, sometimes uh, sounds like, uh, like dangerous at uh, the nuclear aspect. And in fact, it's not so uh, dangerous, but it's quite distinct to the other imaging modalities because here the imaging source is not being um, from the outside, but essentially what happens with nuclear imaging medicine uh, imaging is that there's a tracer molecule that holds an unstable isotope like a radionucleotide that is being injected again into the body. Um, so it's another form of functional imaging uh, techniques but it's using radio tracers to visualize and measure changes in, for example, metabolic processes and in other uh, physiological activities, including again, blood flow, but also regional chem chemical composition and absor absorption. Okay. As I mentioned, the tracer module is administered uh, with an unstable isotope. And there are two types of isotopes, a positron emission uh, tomography, like a PET scan, 
or a single photon emission computed uh, tomography aspect uh, scan. And basically in the latter, for example, the isotope is uh, emitting gamma rays and it's the gamma rays that, is being, that are being emitted. And essentially the, uh, if the tracer is moving down the, the body and is being absorbed uh, by certain uh, metabolic processes, then there the tracer will light up. And basically that's why you see all these, well, apparently little lamps uh, lighting up in the body and exposing, uh, well, the proper functioning of a metabolic process or the malfunctioning of a metabolic process, uh, of course, as well. And this kind of imaging is typically combined with a anatomical imaging. So for example, MRI, you can combine with a PET so that you can also lo localize the metabolic processes. So this is then known as a PET MRI but you also have a PET-CT or a SPECT-CT. Uh, in fact, PET-CT is a very useful uh, in imaging the location activity of cancer and uh, metastasis of cancer. But it's typically a combined imaging, um, the PET or SPECT together with an MRI or CT to gain some anatomical localization of the activities. If I look at all the modalities that I've gone through so far, these are all uh, electromagnetic waves, yeah? And the main difference between them is where exactly these are situated on the electromagnetic wave uh, spectrum. If I go from uh, the shortest waves with the highest frequency, we have on the left here, the gamma rays used in nuclear medicine imaging. Then we have the X-rays used in CT and cone beam CT. Then there is the aspect of visible light in the 2D, 3D and 4D uh, photography, but also uh, endoscopy, something I haven't discussed here. And then there is thermal imaging, which I also haven't discussed. But at the other end of the spectrum, we have uh, radiomagnetic waves as used in, in MRI. So all of these modalities are basically uh, electromagnetic waves and they're basically different from each other in the wavelength of the, uh, the imaging modality used. But there is one more imaging modality that is not an electromagnetic wave. And this is known as ultrasound. Ultrasound is based on the time of flight of ultra high uh, ultra high sound waves. Huh? So in contrast to the other imaging modality, it's, it's, it's a sound wave and not an electromagnetic wave. Sound waves as well, they undergo uh, reflection and refraction depending on the underlying tissue. And with, again, for example, if I have a sound wave and it, it hits on bone, it, ha it has a perfect re reflection. But if it, if it hits soft tissue, it's going to be refracted. And if I basically send down a sound wave and it's being reflected and I measure the time of flight uh, between sending it out and receiving it back, you can then uh, form an image. And I think every one of us or the most of us are most familiar with ultrasound thanks to, um, um, well, the ultrasound imaginations of fetus imaging during pregnancy. And many parents then take the very first image of their child and show it to the rest of their family. And ultrasound as well, much like other uh, modalities have really uh, known an expansion in technology and we can go from the traditional two-dimensional ultrasounds here to now today we can also do a 3D uh, ultrasound. We can also have a 4D ultrasound, so a movie of the baby and then the high definition ultrasound. So here as well, there is a lot of technical advancements that, that took place um, to increase the use and value of these images. Independent of the imaging modality, the complexity of an image data is mainly defined by three factors. And the first factor is resolution, as illustrated on the top. Uh, resolution, this is an aspect also where each manufacturer of an imaging device tries to improve their systems with. As I mentioned in the beginning, the cell phones in the early days, we had a one, one or two megabyte uh, pixel camera. Today we have cameras with a much, much higher resolution. So with lower resolutions, the problem there, we basically not always see what we want to see. For A, if the resolution is too low, like the five by five, we don't see that the letter R is actually displayed. And the advantage of increasing the resolution is that you have a sharper uh, vision of what is, well, for example, the R in this, uh, this illustration, but essentially also in the medical imaging, uh, the better delineation of the heart or the liver or other organs are, are becoming possible if the resolution increases. Another aspect that is, that is clearly uh, well, involved in imaging is the signal to nose, noise ratio. So any ray or wave detector introduces noise into the signal. And if we look at the imaging modalities we've covered so far, examples of high signal to noise imaging. So where, they, where there is a lot of signal and not a lot of noise, we talk about photography and CT. And they have a very good signal to noise ratio. 
on, in contrast, when you look at MRI and ultrasound, it's the opposite. The signal to noise ratio is low. So there's a lot of noise in these images. And the last aspect that is contributing to the complexity of image data is imaging artifacts. And these are specific for each imaging modality, but they always introduce some artifacts. You can see some streaked artifacts here. Essentially, this is a CT scan of a, a mandibular with teeth fillings and the, the amalgam fillings, so the metal fillings in the teeth are basically uh, are creating artifacts as they um, interact with the X-ray uh, beam. And so they really scatter um, the X-ray uh, beams, essentially. So this is known as uh, metal streak uh, artifacts. So these are the three aspects to keep in mind when you, when you work on image data. So the higher the resolution, the better. The higher the signal to noise res, uh, ratio, also the higher the quality. And the lower the artifacts, the better as well to do some analysis, which brings me to the next part of this talk. What about the analysis itself? So we've covered some modalities. If I look at imaging processing and analysis, I make a distinction between, well, simple operations on imaging, segmentation, registration, representation, recognition, and generation. I will go by these one by one to explain to you what it all means and what the purpose of these can be in a medical setting. First of all, simple imaging operations. And the one a key example here is what is known as histogram transformation. It's a very basic operation. And I always say like you can even open Adobe Photoshop and, and apply this kind of transformation to any image you would import there. So histogram, uh, histogram transformations are quite popular in, in Photoshop as well. It basically involves a transformation of the gray value histogram. Right? This is to enhance and emphasize different gray value uh, uh, intervals. In this example, this is the, the original uh, range of gray values. If you really wanna focus, let's say, on the parts of the lungs and have the details of the lungs, you can transform the histogram to emphasize that part and you will see at the expense of the other surrounding tissue. So that you cannot really discriminate anymore here, but you really see the details of the lungs. And the opposite, you can also transform the, the same histogram differently by and hence emphasizing the surrounding tissues, but having no detail left in the lungs whatsoever. So histogram uh, transformations, are often used in, in radiological examinations. Uh, if, if I want to see uh, lung damage, for example, as a radi uh, um, well, radiographer, then I would uh, emphasize the structures in the lungs uh, much more, especially for COVID investigations today and the damage that they do in the lungs, you would, do, uh, you, you perf would perform such a transformation to emphasize any damage uh, done to the lungs. But they're very simple to do. But there are some other simple things that we can do, and they already generate some, well, very interesting applications and, and aspects. And the other operations that I'm talking about here are known as linear image filters. So a filter is something like this. It's a small windows and it has some weights. And this, will, this filter is being um, convolved over the image, as you can see here. So the blue one is my image and the filter is being basically slided up from top to bottom and to below. And essentially, I'm applying this filter to do certain operations. If I'm using, for example, the filter here in the middle, which is basically 111, and essentially what this does, is it's counting up the value of nine uh, pixels and taking the average. So this is a smoothing uh, filter. If I apply that filter to this image, I get a smoothed version of that same uh, uh, image. If I apply a filter like this or like that, I will be detecting edges. In the one hand, vertical edges. On the other hand, horizontal edges. If I apply multiple of these filters together, I can basically run an edge detection onto the image. And then you can also start playing around with the filtered results. You can add one, the smoothed, to the edge uh, detector. And then you have something what is known as uh, image sharpening. So the result here is a sharpening version of the uh, original image. And this is the key. Uh, of image filters. And in the past, again, this was basically what engineers were looking at, trying to find out the filters to, to perform uh, certain tasks. And I think you could have guessed why am I saying that? Because today, this task has been taken over by deep learning. But deep learning, in essence, is again simply filtering. Deep learning on imaging using convolutional neural networks are nothing more than filtering images in the same way we have been filtering images for 30 years and more. But the main difference is instead of trying to come up with designed filters, the deep learning is going to learn the weights to extract features from the image that are deemed necessary or useful uh, to solve a certain task. 
And the other difference is instead of single, instead of running a single level of filters, you're going to continuously um, do this operation so that we can extract simple features and make more abstract, more complex uh, features by increasing the levels or the depth, uh, in other words, in the deep learning uh, network. But essentially, this is how deep learning extends uh, simple linear filtering uh, on images, uh, which has been done for many years. And because uh, deep learning is so good as it, it doesn't come as a surprise that deep learning is also overtaking some typical operations on images. Here you see, for example, an operation that is often wanted is uh, super resolution. So you try to increase the resolution artificially of an image from a lower resolution image. This is of course very interesting. If you're dealing with a low resolution camera, you can still artificially increase the resolution and hence the detail that the image is displayed. And this network is basically trained on a, on a database of images of both low and high resolution. And it really learned to transfer, to, to upgrade these low resolution images into a higher resolution equivalent. And once learned, once the filters have been learned, you can essentially uh, deploy them on new images and hence increase the resolution. And this is a Google uh, product, by the way, that is being shown here. That brings me to the first, so operations are one, that brings me to the first more semantic um, image operation, which is known as segmentation. So image segmentation, if you wanna have a definition, is essentially the process of partitioning an image into different meaningful segments. You're trying to delineate that the parts that are of interest for you. Here, for example, is an anatomical segmentation of the brain into gray matter, white matter, and, and CSF, so the filling, the fluid filling uh, between the matters. Or here, a lesion segmentation of a tumor, that's your segmentation outcome, or um, WMH stands for white matter hyperintensities, which is often, uh, which is, um, uh, brain damage inflicted by multiple uh, sclerosis. And by segmenting it and hence measuring the effect of these lesions, we can also uh, make uh, some clinical interpretations of the condition of the patient. Uh, you can, for example, measure if the tumor has been growing in the last few weeks, or if you're, hand if you're giving a treatment to a person, you can measure if the tumor uh, hopefully has shrunk in size so that you can see if the treatment is actually having an effect and so segmentation is one of the core um, analysis that is being done in medical image analysis uh, for patient monitoring. Segmentation can be done in different ways. And the first way you can do so is as an object delineation task. And basically it's trying to find the contour or the surface of the context uh, of the object of interest. It's no more than that. There are quite some algorithms that are basically trying to model this, successful ones as well. But essentially, you're trying to delineate uh, this. And in the past, it, this was done also manually by the radiographer uh, on the screen, essentially. Segmentation can also be done by partitioning, where you take, where you take the, the image as a whole, and you're trying to define neighborhoods by looking at, for example, similar intensity values. Yeah? This is a very naive segmentation, as you can see here. But that's the idea. I'm just going to try to group pixels together into coherent regions. And the most promising way of segmentation is segmentation by classification. Here you're going to try to classify a pixel. So an image is a lot of pixels, a lot of voxels. And for each of them, you're going to try to learn with machine learning or any other kind of tool, a classifier that's going to predict the class to which the, the pixel belongs to. And this is essentially where deep learning has taken over. Deep learning is now doing a, basically a classification-based segmentation. So it takes in the image, like you can see here, even for autonomous driving, the same happens. If the car is looking in front of the street, there's a deep learning network that is trying to classify each pixel into a category. What is the street? What is the moving uh, people? What are the trees? Uh, and so on. And in the medical imaging analysis, the exact same thing happens. So the image goes in and for each pixel, there is a label being put out as a probability of it belonging to, uh, for example, a tumor. And I can see here the UNET is one of, one of uh, such AI systems against an expert delineation. It's really getting close to uh, achieving the same uh, results. Another kind of uh, operation on images aside from segmentation is what is known as registration. It's the process of spatially aligning multiple images into a single coordinate system. And typically in medical imaging, this comes from different imaging modalities. So for example, a person had undergone a CT scan and an MRI. You can then try to align both to superimpose and fuse the information of both. 
Or for example, a person has undergone uh, surgery and you basically want to see uh, changes uh, based on aligning two images. I, I give you a, a geographical uh, ex example of image alignment, but here you can see a surface-based image alignment where essentially the alignment consisted of a, a facial template, a white mask that is being deformed and shaped into the face of a person. So basically it's like indicating thousands of points on, a, on an individual face. So you can do that for large databases and that's interesting for reasons I will show you uh, later on. But these are uh, other examples of why registration of, is of interest. So if you have two CT scans, um, the first one is the original, the second one is an angiograph, uh, so CT with, with, an, with a, a contrast agent added. If you then do a non-rigid registration of a normal CT scan and the one with the contrast agent added, you can really segment out everything except for the blood vessels. So that's a kind of application of image registration where you can then emphasize uh, the differences between two images, uh, one with and one without a contrast agent. And then you really segment out all the blood vessels uh, and you can really focus on that. Or intrapatient MRI CT scan. So this is um, the same person uh, scanned with a CT and MRI. And as you can clearly see here, a CT scan harvests or shows different kind of information and actually has a lot of information on the heart tissue. Uh, MRI scan, on the other hand, has a lot of information on the soft tissue. So if you combine and merge them, you have a good vision on the heart tissue as well as the soft tissues in the human head for this example. So that's also done through image registration. And in fact, you can also at uh, gain segmentation by using a registration. For example, if you have an atlas, so if you have a brain template in which you nicely indicated certain brain regions according to functionality or, or whatever, you can register the atlas to an unseen image and as such um, transform or transfer the, 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 the labeled segments as such. So this is basically another way of getting to a segmentation, but now using image registration. And today again, Deep learning has kind of overtaken uh, the problem of image registration. I will spare you the details, but uh, there are some really nice autoencoding systems that are able to, given two images, to map one image onto the other in a single step. Like most uh, registration algorithms so far up until the point of deep learning were kind of iterative in nature. You had to find a solution and then improve the solution in the next iteration and keep on iterating until the solution didn't improve anymore. One of the benefits of deep learning equivalents to registration is a single step solution. So the, the network gives you a, a mapped uh, version of one image to the other in an instant. And the nice thing about registration is that you can also then work towards image representation or embedding. An image representation is basically or often a transformation into a low dimensional representation that still retains meaningful properties of the original data, right? As I mentioned in the beginning of the talk, an image is really big in data. So there is always an interest to trying to downscale the amount of data you need to retain. For example, if I look at the full uh, image here of healthy and uh, diseased people, I would like to be able to map them into a same uh, lower dimensional representation. And then hopefully uh, those mappings will then also tell me how the diseased uh, images are uh, separable from healthy images. And so I can then use this representation as a diagnostic tool. I now have a new image coming in and I'm, I map that image or I embed the image into the same representation space. And depending whether it's closely to the diseased or the healthy individuals, I can make a diagnostic outcome and say, okay, this, this uh, configuration is definitely to the diseased or the healthy uh, situation. So a lower dimensional representation uh, is always very interesting for image data. And for in, in many, in many uh, for many years, uh, the following concept has been quite strong in doing so. It's, some, it's known as a statistical shape model. And I'm going to illustrate this based on uh, facial images also because I've been working a lot with, with them, but essentially in such a representation, a single point represents a single uh, facial image. So it's a high dimensional uh, space, but of course, um, I'm just illustrating it as a two dimensional uh, graph here because of, uh, well, illustration constraints, but each point is a full face. And if you represent your data as such, it's really easy to construct, for example, the average face, which is basically the gravity point of your point cloud. Or you can also look for modes of variation. In, in, in this case, it's showing me uh, differences of faces due to age. And on the one side, if I would move along this direction, I have very young, small faces. 
on this side of the direction, I have very older, more matured facial uh, shapes. So this is the mode of variation that you can then extract from your images. You can extract more, like a second mode of variation. And for faces, this is really the difference between elongated, small, uh, well, tall and, and narrow faces and small and, and broad uh, faces on the, on the other hand. And then here you can still see some others, like this is a third mode of variation. And this, all these modes of variations combined are known as an active shape model. So you can, you can really model the variation that is present in the images and you can use that model to determine things like, for example, a boundary within which you say, okay, if I'm within the boundary, I'm definitely dealing with a plausible face. Outside the boundary, I'm going away from the facial uh, configurations and I'm creating anything but a face. So it gives you a probability model yeah, of what, what facial probability is given a face. And today as well, active shape models have now been replaced by uh, deep learning uh, alternatives. And, and the key network to use here is an autoencoder. So here typically you have an encoding stage of your shape and then a decoding shape. And, the, and at the middle, you have your lower dimensional space that is then replacing um, the active shape model. And here, essentially what I'm trying to, what I show here is I, I trained an autoencoder on 16,000 faces. And then I did some kind of TSME uh, visualization of the faces. And as you can see, the autoencoder is able to encode faces that look alike closer to each other. So it's clear that the autoencoder is, is, is learning what facial variability is all about. So that's the, the next step of, of representation learning, but now using deep learning. If you do some representation learning, it's also very easy to start to do some recognition. Like image recognition is basically the ability to identify objects, places, or people writing in actions in images. And in medical imaging, recognition is often related to finding imaging biomarkers for diagnostics and prognosis. For example, if you're doing some tumor delineation, but you have different tumors in a longer in a, in a data set where patients have been followed up longitudinally, and you have some outcome of the prognosis, uh, whether the survival, yes or no, you can then turn, train machine learning networks that given the image, try to predict the prognosis. So what is the chance of survival of the patient given the current uh, tumor segmentation here? Um, or if I look at faces again, if I give it a facial gestalt, can I, can I diagnose a certain syndrome, yes or no? And for example, this is the average face of a control group and this is the average face of the Cantu uh, syndrome. The idea is to look at specific features in the face, biomarkers in the face of the image, and now you can then end uh, concluding a diagnostic uh, outcome, yes or no, or a prognostic outcome. And essentially recognition on image learning, yeah, again here deep learning is, is, is excelling at it. Eh? As I mentioned in the beginning of the talk, ImageNet is all about recognition from images and eh, like objects, but also uh, facially here now I'm showing you an app that is actually in place. So it's commercially available for clinical genetics, geneticists to just take a picture of the, of a of a patient and to have some kind of uh, facial interpretation of the potential underlying syndrome that is presented. And it works really well, it works really accurately. Yeah? So recognition again from images is something that is uh, commonly done and very interesting for machine learning to be deployed. An interesting network that I always like to use when I try to recognize um, aspects in this case, syndrome classification, is, uh, is a triplet loss network. And the reason I'm saying this is because in, in medical conditions, eh, in contrast to ImageNet, which is on, on mainstream image data, which can be gathered by, by, by the millions, in, in medical settings, you often don't have very large data sets. So you really need to look into mechanisms and learning paradigms that allow you to optimize the use of the data. And the triplet loss is one of those. Instead of trying to classify an image, given the image only, the triplet loss is going to use triplets of your data. So triplets of images together. And basically what typically does, it gives you an anchor. This is, the, this is the, the standard image, let's say, a positive example. So this is an image of a person, let's say in this case of the same syndromic group and a negative example. So it's another image of a, someone from another group. And what the triplet loss is trying to do, it's trying to learn a new embedding of the data such that the distance between the anchor and the positive example goes down and the distance with the anchor and the negative example goes up. So it's really trying to cluster your data based on these labels. But the advantage basically is that you can use triplets of data and, and each anchor can be combined with multiple negative or positive examples. So you're reusing your data in a very efficient way. And such a network is 
clearly interesting for uh, medical uh, applications and medical data sets uh, as such. And if you do so for facial shape, uh, for example, I, I learned triplet loss uh, to separate males from females here. And it's also nice to see that the embedding indeed is putting really extreme uh, males on the one hand and really extreme females on the other hand. And then there where the two cohorts are touching upon each other, indeed the distinction between the male or female face is less clear. So here is basically, uh, it, you can have some confusion whether it's a male or female. And on the right, I've also learned something, but then more in terms of age. So the yellow are the older faces and the blue ones that are shown here are younger faces. So again, you can learn to recognize age by, by just looking at an image or learn to recognize uh, the sex by just looking at an image. That brings me to the last typical operation, which is generation. And generation essentially is a task of generating new imaging, uh, images from an existing data set. And this is typically done for simulation purposes. So if I have a known condition, I, I would like to generate something that I want, that I think is gonna happen. So if, I, if you look at the animation here, that was one too fast, Peter. If I look at the animation, so I'm, I try to plan an orthognatic surgery by uh, moving the chin forward. So I'm asking myself, what would the facial envelope look like if I do uh, this? Uh, and that is basically an application of image generation. You're trying to generate something that hasn't been given yet. So synthetically generate images. Well, again, if you have your models, it's quite easy to generate uh, images by simply sampling within the boundaries. So here you can, here you have your active shape model. If you simply sample within the boundary, you can generate new faces that has not, have not seen, been seen before. And I think most of you are familiar with this, at least I, I've seen it in the media a few times now. Again, deep learning is really good at generating uh, images and then, well, the best network to, to start engaging uh, with this kind of work is the generative adver adversarial uh, network training. So you have a generator of images and at the same time you have a discriminating uh, network that tries to say uh, whether the image is correct, fake, yes or no. And then the generator is learning to improve himself to fool the discriminator. It's like a, a police versus thief kind of game um, where the one tries to outsmart the other. And that comes down to the adversarial training. But what I, what I, th what I thought was interesting to show is for example, at the latest uh, results obtained by NVIDIA on the left here, they've basically uh, trained a network that is generating faces, but all of these faces are synthetic. So none of them uh, do actually exist. Uh, and to, in my opinion, um, the quality of these images is very realistic. But also it has also medical applications and medical applications, for example, is shown here. Let's say um, if you train a network that is able to generate a synthetic CT scan from an original MRI scan. So do, doing intermodality um, uh, changes. So from MRI to CT, you could then generate CT scans from all the MRI scans you have. And it sounds silly. Why would you do this? Well, you should know that a CT scan does not come without a cost. A CT scan is known as an invasive imaging technology with a lot of radiation. So if I can generate a CT scan or something that is equivalent to a CT scan by using a non-invasive imaging technique such as MRI, of course, it's a less burden for the patient uh, to do so. And so it has a lot of advantages in trying to solve this, this question. The earlier publications on this topic are promising, but I think there's still a, a long way to go. That brings me to the last part, but I'm just gonna check. Uh, I think in terms of timing, it might be more interesting um, to- We are a little close. bit flexible. I mean, at most you could do another five minutes to leave five okay. minutes for questions, but up to, I would say up to five minutes uh, of, of talk. Um, yeah, okay. Then, then I think it's just interesting to show a few uh, applications. And again, as I mentioned, these are basically where I've been working on. So there are many, many more, of course. But I just wanted to show you something. I think the third one is extremely uh, exciting for, uh, for, for us. There, there. <laughs> if uh, I may choose here. <laughs> OK, I, I, will, I will try to jump. But the, the forensic one is definitely like a, a virtual autopsy, where all of the imaging modalities are being combined and used to really determine the cause of death and to solve criminal cases. We've also been working uh, extensively on gunshot trajectory. Look here also, uh, if someone's being shot in the head, the purpose of this work is to really highlight uh, the damage done. And it sounds a bit cruel, but if multiple people shoot at you, the, 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 the outcome of this kind of examination is to determine which bullet caused you to die. Um, is it the bullet going through the heart or the bullet going through the liver? And that's, that's key information 
to convict uh, one person, yes or no. Another kind of forensic imaging is bloodstain pattern analysis. Um, here we basically look at the shape of, of bloodstains. We do a segmentation here and a registration into a statistical model that then allows us to deduct the point of origin uh, where the person basically was hit. Or craniofacial reconstruction is uh, also a combination of registration and statistical models to learn the relationship between the skull and the face. And hence, if I give you the skull, the question is, what does the face look like? Yeah. That's another application in forensics. Clinically, people have a lot of questions like the surgeons, for example, have what are the changes that I induce in, on faces before and after? What's the asymmetry? It's clear an asymmetrical case. Have I improved it by how much? And what's the lack of harmony? And again, here by registration, by taking multiple images and superimposing or registering them to each other, you can make these measurements. I know I'm going fast, but I'll, I'll try to make it to the imaging genetics. Asymmetry is the same, and then harmony is basically trying to assess the patient in the context of the larger population, and as such, as such create something like a normal equivalent. So this is like the patient without the asymmetrical component in the face, and that can be used to plan uh, virtually a complete uh, uh, treatment so that the, the time in theater itself can be reduced from one day to an hour. Um, so that's where imaging comes into play. This is diagnostics, growth curves, syndrome classification, triplet loss. I'm just gonna stop, skip, okay, to the imaging genetics. Imaging genetics basically is trying to also understand this complex puzzle of going to the genome and to your phenome. So hey, how does it come? that, it, that um, certain variants lead to certain facial shapes in this case. Uh, the difference basically with bioinformatics is that we really focus on the phenotyping aspect. So I try to improve the phenotyping through the imaging and I'm basically uh, using tools from bioinformatics and others to hence uh, deduct some information. And that generates a lot of kind of inv investigations that we can start doing like developmental aspects, of, like for example, what's the effect of uh, alcohol during pregnancy on the facial shape? How does a face grow from uh, one to, to uh, 25 years of old? What is facial heritability? So here also, just by collecting imaging and by uh, register and uh, images, uh, images and by bringing them to lower dimensional representations, we can really uh, yield the power to find correlations between, um, in this case, heritability, genetics and facial shape. But also evolutionary questions can be answered. Like I finished, uh, did some investigation of climate adaptation to nose sh uh, shape. And essentially uh, their colder climate in Europe is responsible for our smaller uh, noses here, but also population uh, genetics can be correlated to facial shape. And hence we can generate uh, my brothers from around the world, I always say. So same person, but a different population background and investigate other questions like, is there a relationship between heterozygosity and facial masculinity? I can answer that the relationship was absent. Um, and then last but not least, I guess, yeah, we have the whole uh, genotype to phenotype correlation analysis. It can also be done. We're bas basically uh, like a GWAS paradigm. And here we, basic, uh, we, we generated some kind of imaging technique um, that was able to divide and conquer the wealth of data in imaging by looking at segments in the face and breaking down the image into correlated segments. So it's a data-driven segmentation. It's not a manual segmentation that really allow to optimize the power of uh, a GWAS onto facial shape and hence identify many more loci than were previously identified. And then I kind of like to play with the idea of you have uh, genetic uh, correlated aspects, then yeah, we might try to model uh, even an image, so image generation from DNA, which is then referred to as DNA phenotyping, or the opposite, um, an opposite paradigm where I basically don't try to generate a face from DNA, but if I give you a face, I try to classify to see if the face fits to a given DNA. So it's a, it's a rephrasing of the problem. But instead of image generation, you're doing uh, image recognition. And again, here in the last part, recognition, deep learning, and learning, machine learning in general, it's like a classification really excels at solving this problem. So when I contrasted the results of DNA phenotyping to facial recognition from DNA, the latter proved to be much stronger in uh, establishing a link between a face and DNA than the former, basically. I think that's, that's the main overall message that I still wanted to get, convey here today. So I'm, I'm happy to hear any questions, if there are any. If not, then thanks again for having me. But Thank you, Peter, for this great overview. That was uh, very educating and, and very exciting. Thank you.
My pleasure. Are there, are there questions from the audience? People are sending applause to you for this for this talk. That was great. That's nice. Thanks. Yeah. So I have one question here in the chat by Leslie. For generating CT scans from MRIs, do you think the biggest driver for improvement will be due to more or better data or better mod or are better models needed? Yep. There's certainly a, um, the twofold. Um, yes, there is more data needed. There are only very few databases that have both MRI and CT scans of the same uh, individual. So it's really hard to get like paired data. So that's definitely an avenue to, to increase on, but it's not easy because CT scanning is, is not done without any ethical concerns. So I strongly believe that the unsupervised paradigms where we see more and more of today, like there is this uh, thing of image to image conversion where you basically can simply collect large databases of CT scans and large databases of MRI scans and really try to generate one from the other. Uh, and this is all gun based essentially. And then you're, you're using the, the smaller data sets where you do have paired data to optimize uh, the, well, the conditional learning eh? but because it's a conditioned network where the conditioning is uh, an MRI image and you wanna generate a CT scan that fits to that MRI image. So it cannot be completely unsupervised. But in short, it's an increase of data, and well, we need we need to investigate in new uh, new learning paradigms. Essentially, it's a thank you. Of both. Yeah. Then there's another question by Giovanni, an, an ESR in the network, doctoral student in the network. Giovanni, please. Hello. Thank you for your talk. I have a quick question regarding this very last part that you described. I wanted to ask you to expand a little bit on how you use genomics essentially for uh, predicting like generating phenotypes and so on. Like, do you focus on specific loci? Um, I, I suppose you don't use complete genomic sequences because that would be uh, a little bit too much. Um, for example, in the previous slides before, I think. This one? Or, or the one before with the face. But yeah, uh, I wanted to, to ask in which format you use specifically DNA. Uh, yep. That's a good question. So essentially the information that is of value to creating faces from DNA, but before I answer, I also have to admit and be upfront that the prediction of a face from DNA is far from accurate, impossible. And I say this because I know there are some commercial companies that pretend that it is possible there, but they never really validated their work. But the information that is of interest is are a few aspects. First of all is the sex, which is basically uh, determined by the X and Y chromosome. And secondly, there is the, the aspect of population or ancestry. Um, and so far I've been working mainly with simple principal component analysis of, of SNP data to generate these as you would ask, uh, to correct for the confounding in a GWAS. Today, we are investigating variational autoencoders to do the same thing and to see if, the, if they don't code for ancestral variation better than that. But that's like the, the genomic view. And then aside from that, we're, we're still only limited still at um, individual SNP data. So it's, it's definitely not full genome data. It's more like the low side that we've identified to be associated to facial shape. We don't have something like a polygenetic risk score yet, although, and I can, I, maybe I can send it around later, we do have a paper currently already uh, out as a preprint, but it's under review, uh, under, uh, review still. That is, well, we call it a polygenic shape score. Um, and, and it, it, for the first time, tried to really condense a GWAS into, well, some kind of facial phenotype prediction. But there, I can also tell you that that is again limited to kind of cross-population shape differences. Uh, we found like, uh, it was interesting. We did a GWAS on an Asian population and an Asian population only. And if we combine certain genetic loci into these shape scores, we were actually able to generate a European face from, a, from an Asian cohort. That's kind of the, the thing we saw. Uh, but aside from that, it's not gonna expose an individual uh, within Europe or, or anything like that. I see. Thank you. That's yeah. really fascinating. Thank you, Giovanni. Uh, we have time for one quick question by Lucas. Thanks a lot, Carson, and thank you, Peter, for, for the talk. I was wondering, regarding the imaging modalities that you presented, there are some of, of them that have, to my uh, small and limited understanding, a lot of heavy preprocessing attached to them, such as uh, functional MRI, for example. Are there any solutions proposed to automate uh, this heavy preprocessing using deep learning, for example? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, uh, but you're right. Uh, like I, I just gave a brief overview. 
but a lot of these imaging modalities really come with a lot of noise um, and hence the, the post-processing is important. I can tell you that the manufacturers of these devices already spend a lot of energy in, in updating the post-processing of the imaging. They're, they're, the, their clientele in the end is, is a medical doctor, a radiologist who has no knowledge of post-processing. So they try to basically re, uh, relieve the burden and, and get the best image out. But I always find it a double coin. Like if you do a lot of post-processing, you're not really sure if you're actually not eliminated the information that you were looking for in the first place. So post-processing also comes at a, at a cost, I would say. But here you're right. Also, a lot of these manufacturers are investing in deep learning to solve uh, many of these tasks. And if I can say, if I look at my experience, there is a lot of traditional algorithms that are able to solve a problem, but deep learning is, is, to do, is able to do the same, but it's, it's better at, at dealing with noisy and, and more differentiating situations. So it basically expands the applicability of some previously uh, already well-working algorithms. Thank you very much, uh, Lucas and Peter. And thank you, Peter, again for this yep. talk and also for taking the time now to meet our My doctoral pleasure. students in the breakout room. We are also grateful for that. The general audience, the PIs and myself, we say goodbye for now. Uh, okay. and, and thank you. We are grateful that you, uh, that you joined the summer school. Um, and we invite you to, to meet the doctoral students in the breakout room. And the general program here continues in half an hour with Jennifer Listgarden's talk. See you all then uh, at 4.30. Central European time. Thank you, Peter.